I'm going to start in verse 18, then we're going to kind of take a snapshot and blaze on through. Chapter 18, verse 18 says, So Paul still remained a good while, or literally many days, in Corinth. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned <coughs> excuse me, with the Jews. Then they asked him to stay a longer time with them, but he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea and gone up, literally the idea is went to Jerusalem and greeted the church, he then went down to Antioch. Verse 23a, it says, After he had spent some days, some time there in Antioch, he departed. So, tonight's study will conclude the second missionary journey of Paul. And that's why we didn't kind of jump into the next set of verses. We want to close that trip out and then we're going to look because the next trip will be kind of quick and fast moving again. But last week we took a look at Paul getting to Corinth there. Again, by himself, a city of six, 700,000 people given to, to all kinds of immorality. The, the main deity or goddess there was Aphrodite. And she was... Uh, the goddess of sex or pleasure was the idea. And part of the worship of that, there was a thousand temple prostitutes that would go down into the town every day. And part of the regular portion of worship would be for men and women and boys to partake. That's, that's what that was. And so Paul gets there, leaving Athens. He gets there. And we kind of walked through all that. What he was seeing, what was going on in there, the hustle and bustle of Corinth, the capital there. The fact that it had the western port, uh, I believe, of Lechium and the eastern port of Centria, which is where he sails out of. And that it narrowed down to an isthmus there. And it was one of the main ports in the Mediterranean world. All sorts of trade and commerce going through that place. And so Paul gets there. I'm just kind of giving you a synopsis of verses 1 through 11. Paul gets there. And when Silas and Timothy show up with an offering there from Philippi, it says it emboldens Paul, the Scripture says, to preach that Jesus was the Christ. And so he gets this this fresh, you know what it is, you're in a work and then somebody sends you good word in the midst of it and it gives you that fresh energy, that stirring up of the Spirit to say yes and amen. Kind of like what happened with me yesterday. Standing in the midst of those ladies thinking like, "This this is unbelievable. This is what I get to do. And so Paul, he's emboldened then to go do that. And the Jews, they oppose him by this point. And the opposition there, it literally means that they set up battle array against him. That's the word that, that Luke uses as he's writing there. So they set up this, this, this intentional attack against Paul. And he gets frustrated with them. And I'm going to paraphrase what he says. But he says something like, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm not going to you anymore. I'm just going to go to the Gentiles. He says, like Popeye, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. That's what he says to him. I'm done. You guys got it all figured out. I'm out of here. And he's discouraged, and we looked at it at some point, his, there's fear and discouragement that enters his heart, so much so that the Lord shows up to him in a vision by night, and he says, Paul, and, and the grammar is literally, stop being afraid. Don't be scared. He says, don't shut up your mouth, don't shut my word up. You speak, and the reason that you shouldn't be scared and should continue on is because I'm with you. Right? He doesn't say because you're a student of Gamaliel that you've studied, you're a Pharisee. He doesn't give him any credentials. He says the only reason you shouldn't be scared is because I'm with you. The only reason you shouldn't be discouraged is because I'm with you. And he says, I got many. He says, for the reason I'm with you, the reason I want you to talk is because I have many people in this city. And so it says Paul then continues there. That's at the end of verse 11. Paul continues, it says, for a year and a half, for 18 months. Which brings us to where we are, where we were kind of closing out last week. So I'm going to read there, and then we're going to jump right into our verses, starting in verse 12. It says, When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, 
The Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be judged of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks noticed, not the Jews, the Greeks, they took Sosthenes, who was the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat, but Gallio took no notice of these things. So God fulfilling His promise with Paul that no man would lay a hand on him. Paul was the one that was set upon the judgment seat and that the Jews were bringing accusation against, saying He's telling other people to worship contrary to them, what we believe. And God fulfills His promise that no man is going to lay His hand on you, Paul. I have a specific work set out for you. Which brings us then to where we're at tonight because this is the exhausted point. This is at the end of those 18 months. It says there in verse 18, so Paul still remained a good while. So from that time at the judgment seat, verse 18 says he remained a good while. Then there was that the expiration of what those 18 months were. It says then he took leave of, in verse 18, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. So depending on which chronology you follow, the, the literal date here, Paul set sail to leave around March, and they, they pick specific dates, I'll just say mid-March of 52 AD. At this point, Priscilla and Aquila are believers and begin to make this trek with Paul from Corinth back to Antioch of Syria. Their tent-making trade, along with their love for the Lord and service to Him, allowed them to operate from anywhere. So Paul is set to go back to Antioch. Priscilla and Aquila, who were joining him in Corinth, say, we're going to go with you. And so they set up this, the, 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 the journey gets set in motion for Paul to then get back to Syria of Antioch, which is where we're going to close out at tonight. Getting ready to leave the eastern port in Centria in Corinth, Paul shaves his head there in verse, the end of verse 18. It says, he had his hair cut off at Centria. And notice it says for, the idea is because he had taken a vow. He had taken a vow. So Paul shaves his head, signifying that the completion of some covenant, some vow, or some promise between the Lord and him. So, so Luke gives us this detail. He doesn't give us exactly why. The Old Testament would have the Nazarite vow, and no doubt this is very much symbolic of that. Did, did Paul take a, a Nazarite vow in relationship to something? We're not sure. I want to read to you those verses out of the Old Testament, and I'll kind of paraphrase some of it so that we don't spend <coughs> too much time there. But in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1-21, through 21, it says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of the Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink, and shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink, neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation or vow, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the, gra the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his preparation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or mother, for his brother or sister, when they die because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation shall be holy to the Lord. And if anyone dies suddenly, and it keeps going through this whole picture of this separated vow, this Nazarite vow that a person would take for a specific time and season. Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, 
He shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering, and one ram without blemish as a peace offering, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and their grain offering with their drink offerings. And he offers it, and there at the temple he then ends up shaving his head as a symbol that the vow has been completed. So for you and I, Paul leaving Corinth out of the port of Centria there, he shaves his head. What was Paul's vow in relationship to? Right, Him shaving his head was signifying a time or a season in his life that, that was marked out completed. He had said something to God. And I wrote some ideas here that would put it in context. Was it in regards to consecration while in Corinth from all its immorality? Did Paul leave Athens to get to Corinth and see what was going on there and say, Lord, I'm going to set apart and not come into contact with any unclean thing. Keep me moral, right? Keep my eyes fixed on you. Keep my heart. Job in his life would say, I made a covenant with my eyes with the Lord so that he doesn't look upon another woman. So was that Paul's... What was the vow? I'm giving you different ideas of what was his point of consecration to the Lord because him shaving his head symbolized the completion of the vow he took. Was it in response to the Lord's promise to Paul with his vision to go back into Corinth? Did the the Lord show up to him in that vision and say, look, Paul, you need to go back, stop being scared, speak my word because I'm with you and nobody's going to touch you. Was it, a, was it a vow between Paul and the Lord where Paul said, you know what, Lord, okay, and, I, and, and I'm going to give you all that I am because that's true, because you who you are. This is a, this is a consecration or a, a vow of thanksgiving. I want to thank you that you've done that. I want to set this time aside specifically for you. My own uncomfort, my own pleasures kind of removed from me. Anything that's going to occur between the time of, complete, the time of start and completion is yours, Lord. Was it from further back? Because we don't know. Was it from when he was in the Philippian jail? And you had the earthquake that happened and the chains fell off and the doors opened. Right? We don't know exactly when Paul started <coughs> excuse me, this veil again. But at this point, we see it's at its time of completion. It's com- the, 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 the fulfillment of it has taken place. And so whatever the deal was between Paul and the Lord, Paul is shaving his head and he says, I need to get back to Jerusalem for the feast. The feast would be Passover. He would make these offerings as the custom was in number 6 there. He would bring the locks of hair and burn the hair. And so Paul has made this covenant, this time, this season set aside for God. So as we go through tonight, I want you to understand what we're going to take a a really honest look at is, is, is something as simple as God's times and seasons in life. His times and seasons. Because we, you know, and again, I'm going to touch it softly, but we can get caught up in a good time of blessing and, and, and beauty and forget that this ain't heaven. Things are going to get difficult. You know, when people like fight and clamor after trying to make God's kingdom here, I say, no, Jesus said that in the last days things would wax worse and worse. Never said it was going to be great. I joke all the time, I should buy stock in biotechs and, and disaster relief because we know what the end looks like. <laughs> you know? And I'll be gone by the time it happens. Whoever inherited it's get a lot of money. But Paul sets this, this, this time of consecration, this time of devotion, this time of thanksgiving aside in regards to his relationship with the Lord. Examples. Vows we make for deliverance of or deliverance from. God, if you, then I. Or God, since you, here's what I'll do. Vows we make in relationship to wanting to be a better witness or for being a successful witness. It's not one side or the other. You guys know this. Vows we make to God in regards to healing. To be healed or because we've been healed. I got saved. Drug addiction slips out of my life. I remember walking away from the pulpit that day when I got saved and said, God, what do you want me to do? 
That was my vow. He said, tell everybody. I was saying, Lord, I recognize what You just did. What do You want me to do? Tell everybody. So notice I only get a haircut. I haven't shaved my head yet. <laughs> I'll be running around heaven with a bald head then. Vows we make in regards to asking for open doors or because of doors that God has opened for us. Lord, You've done such and such and so I want to set this aside for You. I want to do this for You, Lord. Vows we make for supernatural intervention or because of supernatural intervention. God, you nothing in earth is going to change this situation but You. And He changes it. If you've seen that before. Or God, there is no way that could have happened except You had done it. And so because of that, here I am, Lord. What do You want me to do? I'll set aside everything. One of the greatest examples I think of in the Old Testament is Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9-11. through 11. She can't have children. She's barren. She wants children. In those days, if you could not have children as a woman, you were shameful. You were looked down upon. You were less than, even among women. And so she says... It says, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the east by the doorstep of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child notice. If, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. One of the clearest pictures of a vow made. God, if you'll do this thing, right? Don't let nobody tell you you can't ask God for something. Lord, please, would I, you, if you have children caught up in drug addiction, if you have a spouse caught up out there on the streets, if you have a sibling or a parent that's, in, that's lost and in the world, you know that feeling. God, whatever you want. The question is, in those seasons and times when He completes what He does, do you fulfill your end? Right? One author wrote this, <coughs> and it's pretty heavy, but I like it. He said, why is it that hundreds of well-meaning Christians attend conventions and conferences for the deepening of the spiritual life, enjoy the ministry there given, and return to life's vocations with a feeling of improvement, yet speedily lapse into their former ways of backsliding and defeat? There are many reasons. But one of the least noted is the matter of incomplete consecration, the sin of broken vows. To many Christians, too, he says, too many Christians make a bargain with God and fail to pay their part of the price. This is sin. We say, God, whatever you want. And then he sends them back to you and you can't stand them and you're like, not able to fulfill your end. So Paul here, we don't know what his vow was. But apparently God fulfilled it and he fulfilled his. And it's important to look as we, we're going to kind of close out this second missionary journey, the ebb and flow of life. The seasons and times that God has set out for each of us. It all looks different. Some have, some have not. Some are being blessed, some feel like they're being cursed. Right? Yes. That's life. That's this world. It, it won't not be that way until we get to heaven. So if you want to go to another church where they're going to tell you it's all peaches and cream and prance through lilies, you're more than welcome to. But life will be difficult sometimes. I just sit in a room with 50 women who are broken. And all I could think of is, my daughters aren't that old yet, but I, I hope if, if any of my kids were to be in that situation, that somebody would be giving them the Word of God, the truth. Lord, I hope. And that's life. The ups and downs, the seasons... Of life. Paul is fulfilling at this point his vow before God, which is a beautiful thing. Right? Verse 19 says this. It 
And he came to Ephesus. So they leave out of the port of Centria. The layover in verse 19. It says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 20, When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he didn't consent, but he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return to you again, God willing, he says. And he sailed from Ephesus. So, they sail out of Centria and they lay over in Ephesus, which is the capital of Asia Minor. This is their journey back now to close out the second missionary journey. It's a little over two years prior to this when Paul and Silas and Timothy, in the beginning of this missionary journey that we're on, they wanted to go into Ephesus. They wanted to go into that region. And if you guys remember that study, the Lord told them by the Spirit, you can't go there. And so now they're on their way back. They're making the trek back probably two and a half years, a little over two years after that point. And they land in Ephesus. And Paul gets the opportunity to go into the synagogue for a day and reason with the Jews there. So much so they say, we want you to stay. And he says, look, I can't. But I'm going to come back again at some point, Lord willing. So though it is only in passing by in order to get to Jerusalem, then back to his home church in Antioch, the Lord sets the stage, again, times and seasons. God might take you into a place and then pass you right on through. And you're like, wait a minute, Lord. You don't ever want to say it to God. I mean, you can. I say it all the time. Hold on, Lord. Right? But He takes them through. And, but He's setting the stage for His future work of the Gospel going forward into the great city of Ephesus. John Phillips wrote this. He says, Although Paul did not feel he could stay himself, his friends Priscilla and Aquila were quite willing to do so. This proved to be a strategic move. They were able to follow up on the interest shown by the Jews, establish their own business interest in the city, and provide a base for Paul for future operations. In the meantime, they could be cultivating the soil so that things would be ready for the harvest upon Paul's return. So, Paul there, he's passing through so he can get back to Antioch. He gets to stop in, share the word of the Lord with them. They want him to stay. He can't, but Priscilla and Aquila stay there and Paul continues on in his journey. Before he leaves, he says, look, I'm coming back. And he says, God willing. We should all consider the idea of God willing. I'm going to read to you some verses out of James chapter 4, starting in verse 13. He says this, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So, for you and I, ultimately all things are marked out by the hand of the Lord, His times and His seasons. Everything in our lives. I mean, I think of the journey in my personal life that the Lord caused in my life to get me up to Calvary one day to hear the Word of the Lord and receive (laughs) salvation. To be born again. Right? There's other people in my life. I think, man, look at the, in my eyes, in my estimation, the randomness of happenstance. Right? Like, how all of these events take place and they seem kind of static and, and unattached. And yet God has a purpose and a plan for all of it. Joseph's life. God was given Joseph these dreams long before it would come to pass. So that he would know in the midst that God is the one on the throne. He wasn't saying, look who I'm going to be. He says, this is what I saw in a dream. This is what the Lord told me. It wasn't His. And so again, it's God's seasons marked out His times. All things by Him. And understand... That's all things in nature. That's all things pertaining to mankind. That's all things pertaining to government. The beginning and the end of the age of this existence is in His hand. Always has been. 
So we look around and we clamor after, I can't believe that guy got voted as president. I can't believe she did it. I can't believe, wait till the primaries and this is what's going to happen. All that stuff taking place, right? <clears throat> Sadly and difficultly sometimes to look at, you look at what happens with your brothers and sisters overseas and you think somehow, God, you're, in the, you're on the throne. Something is going to come out of this. There has to be something. I tell you guys this story all the time. We were sitting going through the list of people who were in the hospital and who needed prayer. And there was two twins, six months old, with terminal cancer. And for weeks, I mean, I straight up, I beat my chest to God. I said, God, there's a lot of things I can give an answer to. This one, I don't get. That was my prayer. You, I said, you got to tell me. I can't figure this out. I can't wrap my head. I know the verses, Lord. I know all that. What I didn't know, he said to me, he said, would you will that I heal them and they're lost for good? Or they be with me forever? And I said, Lord, I, I couldn't pick. I said, Lord, whatever your will is. Because I think if my children, you know. But in his time, in his seasons, he's got it all marked out. There's nothing out of control. Everything completely in his hand. And so Paul... He leaves Ephesus. He lands in Caesarea Maritima. He goes up to Jerusalem. He greets the church there. He leaves Jerusalem and he goes into Antioch of Syria. And he spends time there updating the church as to what took place. So he keeps the feast in Jerusalem like he wanted to. And he goes to Antioch and he updates them on all that took place during that second missionary journey. So as Paul gets there, you know, as we take a snapshot back as his second missionary journey ends. It's about two and a half years of a journey. Something like that. If I'm wrong, forgive me. It's about two and a half years. So sometimes seasons are a week, right? Sometimes seasons are a month. Sometimes they're a decade. And I thought, man, interesting to look. Paul shaves his head signifying the end of this thing between him and the Lord. And gets back. And that's the, you know, chapter 2 of Paul's missionary journeys. And chapter 3 will open shortly. But you look at how he launched out. I mean, the season of his second journey. Think of the man. Put yourself in Paul's shoes for a second. Him and his boy get in a beef when they're getting ready to leave. Him and Barnabas. He says, Barnabas, let's go revisit the churches. That's the beginning of the second missionary journey. Let's go revisit them. All right, cool. We're going to take John Mark with us. Paul's like, <laughs> we ain't taking John with us. Why would we take John Mark with us? Last time he bailed on us. And Barnabas say, no, no, we're taking him with him. And, and it says that the dispute was so sharp between the two that they went their own ways. And Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took Silas. And Paul sets out on his journey. You know, you don't know what was going on in Paul's heart, but he was boys with Barnabas. Probably turmoil, things going on. He meets this young kid, Timothy, in Lystra. 18 years old, 19, 20 years old. Takes him with him, circumcises him. Paul wants to go to the west. The, the Lord says, nope. Paul wants to go up to the northeast. The Lord says, nope. This is his journey. This is the season, this two and a half year season. Beef with his boy. Picking up a kind of, he takes Silas with him. Again, a notable guy, has a young guy with him. Getting ready to do the work and gets shut down two different times. Ends up in Troas. Probably discouraged in some measure. Like, all right, Lord, what's the deal? No doubt his workers are like, man, isn't this Paul the apostle? Isn't this the guy who he got stoned to death and raised back up to life? Isn't this? And gets the vision, the man of Macedonia, the Macedonian saying, come over here, we need you to help us. And they jump on this boat. And a journey that would take five days takes two days. And I'm sure if, you're, if you guys have ever been in service to the Lord and you're like, you know somehow it's supernaturally, you're in the will of God. You can sense it. Everything's fine, kind of like flying through. And you're like, this is incredible. That's what they're going through. And they pass Simon Thrace and they, and they land there and they make their way up into Philippi. And, and the way Paul typically does ministry doesn't exist there. No synagogue. Okay, Lord. Goes down to the river where there's these women praying. This woman named Lydia. 
receives, the Lord opens her heart to receive that all that Paul would say to her. You have the first convert in Europe, the first house church in Europe established. They leave there. All through the rest of this, there's persecution. The Jews follow them. Whenever they have success, the Jews follow them and follow them and follow them. All the way till they, till they leave uh, Thessalonica. They get out of there. They go to Athens. They get out of Athens. He makes his way to Corinth by himself at those points. In Athens, he, he, he sees very little fruit. Some people get saved. Not a big thing goes on. He's in Corinth. The moral degradation, the things that he sees. This is a man in service to the Lord. Trying to be sensitive. Okay, Lord. What are you doing? What are you saying? Where are we going? What am I not saying? Where am I not going? You learned that lesson in the beginning. I'm going here. <laughs> no, you're not. Alright, then I'm going there. Not there either. You know? It's like, does, is, is, guess who? Does your guy have glasses? Nope. Does he have blue eyes? Nope. You're like, man, I, the other guy's got 55 things down on his board. He's about to beat you. You're just like, man. So Paul's in Corinth. And he's discouraged. He's full of fear. So much so that the Lord appears to him in a vision at night. So stop being scared, Paul. That's a journey two and a half years. If you do, if you trace it out on the map, it's around 3,000 miles by foot and sea. No planes, no trains. No automobiles. 3,000 miles. About 100 days worth of traveling. Somewhere around, if you were to do the cost of it, between the three main people serving all the time, if you look at if there were three people, about three years worth of salaries that they didn't leave Antioch with. Just trusting God. Alright, Lord, we're going. And his work's complete. God's promises is fulfilled. And he shaves his head. And he's like, I'm going back. He knows. For us, that's, I mean, I hope I'm not talking for myself. That's the seasons of life sometimes. You beef with somebody you love over a good thing, not a bad thing. And there's a separation. And you don't want that. No, who wants that? Yet you have to do what God is telling you to do. You try to go do something, God shuts you down. We were doing a Bible study in Kensington for like 18 months, years ago. And the Lord told me clear as day, when you finish John's Gospel, you are finished. And when we finished, last two weeks I couldn't teach, I cried the whole time. Like I kept trying to teach. And I kept crying. Because I didn't want to leave. People say, why are you leave? Why do you want to leave? I say, I don't. <laughs> I don't. My time is over. I have to listen. And uh, literally, I said to God the next week, Saturday, I had my whole Saturday. I don't even know what to do with Saturday anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I guess I stay home. I guess that's what you do. I, I felt out of place on my Saturday. If, if the Lord closed the door here, Thursday would be strange for me. You know, you'd go through a couple months of thinking, wait, am I supposed to be doing something today? That's what it'd be like. But you go through those seasons, right? I said to the Lord, when, when Saturday is close, what am I supposed to do now? What was the point of that? And He took me to another place to serve under somebody, to lift their arms when they were tired, to clean the table so they didn't have to, to set up and, and, and plan the picnic so they could, they could give themselves to the Word and to prayer. And a, and, a, and a tremendous season of learning. And then you have a vision from the Lord, like Paul and Troas, this, this Macedonian man. You're like, alright, cool. Right? You get to that next point of that season. Things changing. You get revived, as it were. You're, the, the wind of the Spirit breathes life into your soul. You jump on the boat. The wind's behind you. Getting you where you need to go. You watch success. You watch a church form in your life. No job, no job, no job. God, you got to do something. All right, Mike, go apply over here and get the job. 
I'm just speaking. I don't know. And you're charged up. And then you get the job and the people hate you. You're persecuted. You know what I mean? You're like, what? And then they fire you and you get a new job. Right? Paul ends up, he leaves. And there's success there, the new job. Then they persecute you. You get fired. You're like, why in the world? Your mom gets saved, but your dad thinks you're a kook still. You know what I mean? Like those kind of things in life. The ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of life. You make your way, you know, you sit, I, I sit and reason with people all the time. And you think, all right, got to figure it out. I'm going to reason with them from where they'll understand. And you lay out like he did on Mars Hill, this phenomenal kind of this, 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 this sermon that you got all the points nailed down. I see very little come out of it. It doesn't say, you know, it's interesting when you look at that, it says who was saved. It names three or four people and a few others. And Paul moves on. He doesn't fight for that place. He moves on. You see that. God, do I continue telling that? Or do I move on? What do I say? You get to, you know, Mike, go to South Philly. All right, you get down here, I walk past young guy. I'm like, oh, here we go. Nobody knows what a real relationship is. Nobody's not sure what their gender is, you know, what being financially accountable is, what a curfew is, what drinking isn't, you know, like just the whole thing. I'm like, here we go. It's my, Lord, you sent me to my car. And watch, you know, for some of you been here from the beginning, things go down to three people. Say, all right, Lord. I'll, whatever you want to do, trusting you're able to do much more than that, and to watch a, a a church be planted and a family be established, and people to be given spiritual gifts. You know, Corinth. Paul would write a letter to them. Said, "You guys come behind and no spiritual blessing. You guys got all of it." When anybody ever asks me about you guys, I say it's a fellowship of servants. I said, the only thing that I can figure out, if that's the case, then God wants to do something. Because a fellowship of servants serving each other, that's cool, I guess, but they all have the same heart. (laughs) And God fulfills the work. And then Paul shaves his head and moves on. So for us, the seasons of life, in regards to the natural changing of times, Genesis Chapter 8, verses 20 and 22 say this. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So in the natural seasons of life, He's still on the throne. He's still the one ordering it and establishing it and causing it to come to pass. In regards to supernatural invention of God with men and government, Daniel chapter 2, verses 19 through 22 say this, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel, because God revealed the vision to Daniel, blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, (coughs) Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His hand, are His. And He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and He raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things and He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with Him. So in regards to the supernatural intervention of God and government and and wisdom and knowledge, He still orders it and establishes it. The Scripture still stands true. If any man lacks wisdom... Let him ask. And it says God will lavish it upon them. He'll give it to them. You need only ask. 
in regards to life in general for you and I, and these are verses you guys know. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says this. <laughs> to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Verse 14 and 15 say, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before Him. That which is has already been. And what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. For all of us, through the ups and downs of life, He controls all the seasons. The beauty is this. You know, I said, Lord, okay, that's where we're heading. What do you want me to say tonight? What do you want me to say? He said, tell them about my son. So let me remind you, there's a time ahead also where there's going to be the shout and the voice of the archangel. And those who are dead are going to be raised up and then we who are alive in Christ are going to be raised up into the air and we'll be with Him. And He's going to wipe away every tear. Let me pray.